Hey guys, welcome back to Reserved Investments on YouTube. So by now, with the release of this video, the video that I did on antique and collectible consulting is already up on YouTube and is probably being viewed at present time. So what I wanted to do is, I wanted to give you guys a checklist of what questions you should be asking if you're thinking of investing in any one collectible category for the short term or for the long term. So I compiled a, writ, a list of the who, what, when, where, and how of the antiques and collectibles marketplace that's going to help you in your quest to become a better speculator, a better flipper, a better overall collector, or an investor. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, Sean, if I'm just collecting because I have a passion for this stuff, why do I need to use this list? Well, believe it or not, even if you're just a casual collector that likes this stuff and has no desire to invest in these markets, by going through this little exercise that I'm going to show you guys, you can literally become a better collector and you can learn the spot trends. So then in the future, if you want to trade with other collectors, if you want to make the most out of your purchases, this can benefit you and it can help you over the long term. So we're going to start with the question of what? What are the risks associated with investing in this collectible and am I comfortable taking them? This is something that a lot of the Timmies, a lot of the Poindexters, a lot of the unsophisticated investors out there that are operating on this side of the trade never ever ask. And that's why they end up with a house full of Beanie Babies, a house full of Pogs, or a house full of Pez dispensers. It comes down to asking the right questions and being realistic and honest about the answers. So let's break this down a little. What are the risks associated investing in this collectible at present time? You must look at opportunity cost, time value of money, and a proper risk versus reward scenario. For instance, I'm going to use this example. Let's say that you want to invest in Magic the Gathering and you come to me and you say, Sean, you know what? I'm going to invest in a thousand copies of a modern era card that just got done being printed. I think the price is going to rise over the next coming months. Well, obviously, this should cause alarm for anybody out there who is thinking of utilizing this investing strategy because at any given time, that modern era Magic the Gathering card can be printed at will. It is not on the wonderful coveted reserve list. So as a result, the person who is asking that question is not accurately assessing the risk versus reward scenario of the market. Remember guys, speculators only look at how much money they can make. Investors, people that have money, people like myself, people who literally monitor these markets with an eye of finance, they look at how much money they can possibly lose. We see this every day in the stock market. You don't believe me? Pull up some of the hilarious articles on Robinhood app users and look at some of the stocks that they're buying. It is truly hilarious. I don't know if I have to state this, but any of you out there that are strictly buying stock in a bankrupt company, you're an idiot. You're not an investor. I don't mean options trading. I don't mean put trading. I don't mean anything like that. I am stating if you are going to the market and a company just announced that they are bankrupt and you are buying stock in that company as a way to invest in that company, you are an idiot. You don't understand the risks. That's a prime example. So this is something that is often overlooked. Let me give you one more example. Let's say that you come to me and you go, Sean, to use that same Magic the Gathering scenario, only this time, I'm going to invest in a 50 cent reserve list card because if that card gets bought out, it can go to a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, five dollars, and I can end up doubling, quadrupling my money. Well, here's the problem, little Timmy, that you're not thinking about. That particular card that is listed on the reserve list for 50 cents, there's a reason why it's only selling for 50 cents. It obviously is not on par with a Library of Alexandria. It's not on par with a Mox Opal. It's not even on par with a Lion's Eye Diamond from Mirage. Most likely, that card has very little to no playability. What's attracting you to that card is because it's on the reserve list and it's selling for a price that you can afford. I can tell you right now, 
nine chances out of 10, if you buy that card for a quarter or 50 cents, you're probably going to be stuck with it and you're going to liquidate your holdings at a loss at some time in the short term or the long term. So that's something that you have to deal with. You must analyze these markets properly. Now we're going to get away from the what's and we're going to ask when. When will I be able to liquidate this investment? And will the timing meet my need? This is something that no unsophisticated investor ever asks. That's why if you go on the CGC collecting forums right now, you can find a post where somebody says, I want to buy an Incredible Hulk 181 in CGC 9.4 condition. And somebody else says, well, just take out a home equity loan. You know, at 3% or less on interest, that comic book is guaranteed to appreciate more than that 3% you're going to pay on that money. That is the dumbest advice you could ever give somebody who is operating in speculative markets like the antiques and collectibles trade. You never ever use leverage in most cases to buy items for long-term investment in the antiques and collectibles trade. Let me repeat that to all the people that are watching right now. You never ever use leverage in most cases to invest long-term in antiques and collectibles. It does not work. 95% failure rate where once you go to liquidate that item, after you pay off the debt that you accrued that are pay you're paying interest on for that item, you will most likely lose. Now, there are certain circumstances. Maybe you're like me, other people, you have excellent credit. Sometimes you'll get a credit offer where, hey, for the next 12 months, 0% interest, no balance transfer fees. You can go out, you can use that money free of charge for 12 months. Well, as long as you know that you have the ability to pay that item off at the end of that 12 months, so you encounter no finance charges, you are okay to do that. But you better sure hell understand the risks. Because who could have predicted in the year 2020 that a little microscopic organism would come along and throw everybody's plans up in the air and bring death and destruction in its wake? That is something that no one could have predicted. So that is considered a black swan event. You must prepare for black swan events if you are using any kind of leverage, meaning debt. So keep that in mind. Another thing that I see a lot of people fail at is they don't have a written plan. So you tell me you're buying this for an investment, right? Well, when are you going to sell it? When it doubles in value? When it triples in value? What if it goes down in value? Do you have any type of written plan where you have a alternate plan for any scenario that can unfold by you putting all your money in this particular item? Guys, these markets are speculative. You must understand that. Not every antique and collectible goes up in value. And those that do go up in value cannot go up in value exponentially over the long term. At some point, a correction has to hit the market. It has to. The markets are speculative. So that answers the when. Next question we're going to ask is where? Where will I store my collectibles to make sure they're properly maintained? This is something that most people don't think about. Ironically, there's a lot of millennials out there that have no desire to own a home because they're getting established in their career and they like to move around the country every two, three, four, or five years because if they can make more money working in one city as opposed to another, they'll pick up and move. Well, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't do anything stupid and you buy a home then you have to sell it every five years or every so often. But overall, in the meantime, you have to ask if you're collecting something like vintage video games and you have three rooms full of vintage video games, that's something that's very difficult to keep packing up and moving over and over again. So this comes in the play. You would probably be better off at that point in collecting something that's small and easily portable, something that you could store possibly in a safety deposit box or in a one or two bedroom apartment if that is what you are renting. So this does come into play. There are also risks to how you store those collectibles. So you gotta be very careful. For instance, if you're storing comic books, comic books have a metal staple in them. 
Most people don't realize that if you improperly store a comic book, even if it is graded by CGC, that staple can rust. That rust can then damage the rest of the comic book. So as a result, you have to use common sense and have a plan as to where you're going to store this stuff. Now we're going to get into the why. I love this question. Why am I investing in this type of collectible? Well, first, I'm going to start with the obvious. Do you have a passion for it? Again, you do not want to come into the antiques and collectibles trade with solely an investor mindset. You must have a passion for these items. They've done studies several years back where a lot of these wealth management groups, they talk to wealthy collectors, they talk to wealthy investors. A lot of wealthy people are gravitating towards the collectibles trade simply because they have a passion for a lot of these items and because they've been successful in other areas of their life. So that can spill over, and as a result, they have the money to collect coins, artwork, currency, comic books, toys, whatever it is. Well, ironically, they did studies on this. If a person is coming into these markets and they have no passion for any of the items that they are buying in the antiques and collectibles trade, there is over a 95% failure rate that the person with only an investor mindset will fail at turning a profit long-term over and over again. The person who has the passion and is able to have that passion maintained, meaning they're not dictated solely by passion, they also have an understanding of economics and finance, that person has a 70% more chance of turning a profit in these markets over the long term than the person that doesn't. So just keep that in mind, guys. You really have to ask yourself why you are involved in these markets from a financial perspective if you have no passion. Because really, in all honest, you don't have a reason to be in this market. Does it bring me joy or do I think it will earn a profit? This is the great question that collectors and investors have to have that discussion with themselves. Are you buying this item truly as an investment and something that you have a passion for? Or are you a collector who really loves the item and you are attempting to convince yourself that it is an investment grade item simply because you have so much passion towards it? Where are the fundamentals that show that that item can potentially go up in value and beat returns in other traditional asset classes like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, gold, silver, crypto, whatever you're into. You see what I'm saying? The last question we got to ask, and we really got to explore this, is the how. How much do I know about this collectible's value in history? I can tell you, and this is going to hurt, this is going to be one of those triggering times on this video, a lot of you do not know about as much about the value and the history of the items you are buying into than you think. Now, that's not necessarily true for pop culture items. I will admit that. There's a lot of people my age, we grew up with video games, we grew up with comic books, toys, Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, the like. Yes, we know the history. We understand how those items accelerated in value. But the problem comes when you start looking towards the past and you say, well, that Pokemon card went up 2,000% over the last 10 years. That means in the next 10 years, it's going to go up another 2,000%. That is a fallacy. That is not true, guys. Even in financial markets, you don't look at the past to determine the future value of that particular asset. So you got to be very careful with that. Another thing that sometimes happens, people have a rosy outlook on a lot of these markets, whether their grandfather collected coins or... They had an aunt who loved collecting art pottery and art glass. So they automatically think, based on that nostalgia, that because their aunt collected it or because their grandfather collected it, they could be a successful collector and investor operating in those markets. Those markets are very sophisticated. When you get to the antique side of the trade, you either have to have somebody showing you the ropes you have to be working with a dealer. You have to be working with someone unless, unless you already have the knowledge of those sophisticated markets. So I hope this video has served you well. These are just the questions that you got to ask if you want to invest in collectibles for either the short term or the long term. Thank you guys for watching. Have a great night. I hope you enjoyed this video.